Hi, my name is Larissa Kaiser, and I am the founder and co-organizer of Jill, a Women Plus in Translation reading series that spotlights women and or non-binary translators, or translators of women and or non-binary authors, or both. And I am Elizabeth Redfield. I am the co-organizer of Jill. Um, and we welcome your submissions. Jill uh, runs an ongoing virtual reading series, which you're watching right now. You can find out more about what we're looking for and how to submit your work on our website, www.jillreadingnyc.com. And now enjoy the reading. Hello, my name is Ursula Desser Friedman. I am a second year PhD student at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where I specialize in contemporary Chinese, Taiwanese and Spanish literature, as well as translation studies. I was lucky enough to workshop my translation of Hao Jingfang's Mandarin language novelette, Sheng Si Yu, or Limbo, under the expert tutelage of Professor Suzanne Jill Levine, who taught me that translation necessarily involves some degree of creative subversion, whereby the translator functions as a sort of prism reflecting and refracting the white light of the source text, if you will, into an entire spectrum, all the colors of the rainbow, to invoke a metaphor by first proposed by Lawrence Venuti. May, how about I begin by telling you a bit about Hao Jingfang, who is one of China's most up-and-coming young science fiction authors. So she was born in 1984, is a physicist by training. She earned her PhD in physics from Tsinghua University and works full-time as an economist. She's also an entrepreneur. She has invested heavily in rural grassroots K-12 education in some of China's most remote, impoverished regions. She, her real claim to fame was when her novelette Beijing Zhedie, or Folding Beijing, was awarded the 2016 Hugo Prize for Best Novelette. She actually beat out Stephen King that year. You'll notice that she's written dozens of short stories, including the anthology Gudu Shen Chu, or The Depths of Loneliness, which actually contains Shen Si the novelette that I translated. As well, she actually wrote Vagabond, which is a full-length novel translated by the incredible Ken Leo, who has single-handedly brought Cecilia Leo's Three Body Problem, all these incredible works of contemporary Chinese science fiction to English-speaking readers' bookshelves. Anyway, you'll notice that Hao Jingfang's work is quite psychological and deals with themes of economic inequality. So to give you a bit of background on this novelette, Sheng Si, or Hanging in Limbo Between Life and Death, actually deals with a comatose narrator who is both literally and figuratively hanging in limbo, trying to decide whether he's going to go back to the mortal world and atone for his sins, or whether he is going to consume the elixir of oblivion and be reincarnated and have his spirit fused with a new womb. So he actually enters a world of his own creation woven from the fabric of his own memory. Simply by willing it so, he can cause a far-off building to topple or an incredible feast to appear in front of him. You'll get the sense from the novelette. Why don't I begin by reading the opening passage in Mandarin, then we'll turn to the English translation. Again, this novelette, Limbo, comes from the collection The Depths of Loneliness, Gu Du Shen Chu. This is part one. Shangsu 天空弥漫着大雾
拦腰撞的，人被挤到驾驶座一角，车撞到马路边的栏杆上，金属和玻璃刺入身体。之后，他有印象在医院看到天花板，天花板上。蓝莹莹的手术灯，然后是病房的输液瓶，然后就没有了。然后 ，and limbo part one. He ventured cautiously through this strange twilight city. The sky was gray, the city gray. There was a peculiar feel to this city. The air swollen with an impending danger. The skyline was punctuated by a relentless succession of high rises. The building's rebar skeletons were gray, their glass flanks tinted gray. The gaps between the buildings were inked in impenetrable charcoal gray. The sky was choked by a dense layer of low-hanging clouds. The skyscrapers' invisible crowns swallowed by the ashen haze. As he strode deeper into this city of shadows, he took stock of his surroundings. On constant guard against potential dangers lurking behind hidden street corners, his pace was slow and measured. He did not know where he was. The last thing he remembered was blowing through a red light along Beijing's Second Ring Road at two o'clock in the morning. A black Maserati had come flying out of nowhere, striking his vehicle full on and flattening him into a corner of the driver's seat. His car slammed into the guardrail, metal and glass debris piercing his flesh like a rain of bullets. Later on, he vaguely recalled the bluish gleam of the lights in the operating room and the IV bag in the hospital ward. And then, and then, after regaining consciousness, he had found himself in this strange city, not knowing where he was, not knowing whether he was dead or alive. We'll skip a bit ahead when he runs into a shopkeeper who, besides the gatekeeper of this between life and death, who administers the elixir of oblivion. This shopkeeper is the only other person in this world of his own creation that talks to the narrator. So he asks the shopkeeper how he ended up in this world. Then how did you get here? He asked, his heart skipping a beat, the same way you did. Actually, I haven't got the faintest clue how I ended up here," he admitted. "In time, the answer will be revealed to you." The shopkeeper drew up beside him, bent over to grab an old horsetail whisk hanging by the wall, and began dusting the shelves with slow, methodical motions. He shambled along slowly, as if every footstep cost him an enormous effort. The whisk was gray, just like his sandals and sweater, and the sunlight filtering through the door bathed him in a luminous white halo. Do you know how we can get out of here? Where is it that you want to go? I don't know. Maybe back to Beijing. And then he notices all of the curios that are stuck with dust, and the shopkeeper informs him, "Once you arrive here, there is no turning back." Why not? You cannot overcome what is insurmountable. And what exactly is insurmountable? He exclaimed, alarmed. The shopkeeper paused in his motions, picked up an old pocket watch, the clock hands frozen at two o'clock, and caressed it gently in his palm. After a long pause, he murmured, "The kind of thing that teaches you remorse." I, I don't understand. He weighed each word carefully, his eyes fixed on the shopkeeper's hand. So much the better. May you never understand. He mulled over the shopkeeper's words, sensing a hidden meaning, but what exactly it was, he could not say. The shopkeeper continued to dust the objects with the utmost patience. The blurry photos displayed on the worn packages were creased beyond recognition, and he discovered with a jolt that no sooner had the curios been dusted off than they accrued another thick layer of dust. And now we'll skip ahead. A little bit to the conclusion of part one, when the narrator realizes that this is indeed his own world to will as he please. For example, simply by willing it, so he can cause a sky nearby sky, well, far away skyscraper to collapse. He froze in place, not knowing what to do. There was no denying it. The skyscraper on the distant horizon was careening toward the ground, disintegrating floor by floor, brick by brick. 
He recalled images of the Twin Towers collapsing in 9-11, but he had only ever seen that kind of thing on TV. The building had snapped at the middle, like a wishbone, split at the seam, and was being stripped away floor by floor, shattered bricks and glass spilling out like exploded innards, shooting out every which way and disappearing into the other. There was no dust to speak of, only white smoke that evaporated on the spot. His heart dropped like a stone, joining the endless rain of falling gravel, past the ground, past the shattered debris, deep, deep into a bottomless abyss. Little by little, the entire city was crumbling away into nothingness, like an evaporating mirage. All around him, the buildings were dropping like matchsticks, collapsing one after the other, like an endless chain of dominoes, rippling through the city in all directions. Yet strangely, there was still no sound, as if he were watching a muted slow-motion video playback, every last detail crystal clear. The rebar and concrete disintegrated, flew into the air, and vanished without a trace. He watched, transfixed, as his world folded like a deck of cards. And now we'll skip ahead to the moment where the narrator's life flashes before his eyes. Then it happened. It was an out-of-body experience. Everything vanished. The cave, the ground, the light, all of it. He felt himself hovering above the scene. His arms grew fainter, his silhouette dissolving into the surrounding darkness. His body became feather light, transparent as a veil. He was acutely aware of everything surrounding him, the universe and the distant stars, and then even the stars vanished and he was engulfed in nothingness. Just then, his life flashed before his eyes. His memories were refracted into a series of still life images, from a downy-headed infant to a frail boy, slender as a bamboo reed, fast forward to his present day self, hairline receding and belly bulging. All at once, he saw thousands upon thousands of images of himself frozen in the river of time, like so many stones strewn across the distant earth. In that moment, he saw time itself, perceived the tracks carved by each passing year. Sometime later, a dazzling ray of light greeted his eyes, and he saw a gray skirt billowing in the darkness before him. And now we'll skip to the very end, where the narrator's soul actually latches onto a new womb after he swallows the elixir of oblivion. He tipped his head back and downed the elixir in a single gulp, it gave off hints of sweet herbs and musky earth. He was still filled with uncertainty, but he knew this was what he must do. Even if he were able to achieve immortality, he would never be able to live with himself. If Xiao Hui, the narrator's girlfriend, and I are both reincarnated, will I still be able to recognize her? Yoran shook her head. There's no guarantee. That's entirely up to chance. Yoran sighed. He knew this would be their final farewell. Are you the one who sends everyone on their way? He murmured. How long have you been here? She smiled faintly. You could say only a short while, or perhaps quite a long time. I am not bound by time. I can travel 600 years into the past or future at a whim. Thank you. His body relaxed and grew slack, and drowsiness gradually stole over him. He wanted nothing more than to drift off to sleep, to enter the realm of sweet slumber. He nestled against Yoran, his eyes half open, hoping for one final look at this world, hoping to carry these memories with him into the next life. This broth distills your life energy and purifies your soul. Yoran's voice interrupted his reverie. They call me Old Lady Mung, and this brew Old Lady Mung's elixir of oblivion. At this, he fell into a deep slumber. Darkness subsumed him. He was falling, falling. In the illuminated passageway, his spirit latched onto a new womb. If you're interested in reading the full version, you can check out the Modern Chinese Literature and Culture MCLC Resource Center website, which contains the full version of Limbo by Hao Jingfang, translated with permission of the author. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day.